Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to your conference today about natural capital, biodiversity and the really exciting prospects for environmental restoration. What I want to do is first of all explain why natural capital matters, what it is and why it makes a difference to the way we think about uh, environmental problems and uh, in particular uh, conservation and restoration. I want to explain the distinction between non-renewables and renewables and why uh, the renewables territory is one which uh, all those interested in plants should uh, be focused upon. I want to explain the framework within which we should try to address our natural capital, what I call the aggregate rules. I want to set out how to fund uh, uh, the conservation and restoration of uh, our natural capital and then I want to make a few remarks about the applications to plants. So let's start at the beginning. Natural capital is all the stuff that nature provides us for free and it uh, falls into two broad categories. There's what we call the non-renewables, things like oil and gas and other minerals, which uh, are non-renewable in the sense that we can only use them once. So if we use them in our generation, say we deplete the North Sea oil, then other generations in the future can't enjoy those benefits and therefore we have to make some compensation to those future generations. And that turns out to be really important because that's where a lot of the money for looking after the other kind of natural capital, renewable natural capital, should come from. And renewable natural capital is you know, exactly what it says on the tin. It's those bits of natural capital which are capable of renewing themselves, provided we look after them properly and don't deplete them too far. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So natural capital is uh, all that stuff nature provides for free and it's an asset-based approach. It takes uh, natural capital as stuff which is you know, core to the balance sheet of any economy. And because it treats natural capital as assets, it naturally requires us to think about which of those assets are at risk and, crucially, about how those assets are maintained, what the capital maintenance is that's required to make sure that natural capital does not diminish. And that in turn links to the concept of sustainable growth. You know, without natural capital, without uh, properly maintaining their natural capital assets, there really can't be any economic growth. And therefore, any measure of economic growth and any mainstream economic consideration has to take natural capital seriously. And in the categories non-renewables and renewables, it's the renewables that count. And what we need to do there is the stuff that plant scientists, uh, biologists, ecologists, zoologists do, you know, as part of their everyday business of their science. It's about identifying the thresholds below which, if we deplete these uh, renewable natural assets, uh, they can't carry on being renewable. They literally become non-renewable. And, and that's, of course, going on on an extraordinary scale. We're uh, eliminating species left, right and centre. We're destroying ecosystems. We're destroying habitats. So those thresholds really matter. And then within the category of looking at renewable natural assets, it's those assets and primarily, you know, focused on just those assets which are in danger of going through those thresholds. So we sort out a subset, the assets at risk, and then those are the ones which require the greatest degree of economic attention to protect us from losing the benefits that they would yield to us forever into the future. And if you think about a single species, think uh, easy case, think of say herring in the, in the North Sea and elsewhere, if we drive them below the threshold, then we lose not only the herring now, but forever. And the fact that they are provided for free by nature, the loss of a species like that, a habitat, not, is not just a cost to us. It's a cost to all future generations. So for renewable natural assets, 
we're concerned with the thresholds, we want to find out which assets are at risk of going below the thresholds, and then we want to focus uh, our efforts on preserving those particular assets. And we can think about a rule for sustainable growth going forward, which is essentially a, a rule about not allowing the aggregate, the total bundle of our natural capital to diminish. Uh, as a minimum, we can then move on and say we actually want to uh, enhance our natural capital. And indeed, uh, that is uh, official government policy in this country. And the question then comes, what should you do with the benefits that flow from the depletion of the non-renewables, which you can't uh, uh, preserve and maintain through time. Someone's going to use them. The North Sea oil and gas is going to get used up, as are the minerals. What should we do to compensate for the loss to future generations of those non-renewable assets? And there are basically two ways you can think about that, and two uh, aggregate natural capital rules, as I set out in my book on natural capital. The first says that, well, you should invest the economic rents, the surpluses from the depletion of these resources in just other sorts of capital. So we should be setting aside from, say, the depletion of the North Sea oil and gas, a fund, sovereign wealth fund, which could then be invested in education, health, roads, railways, electricity, and of course natural assets. Or you can go one step further, and I think this is the right way to go, and say that any depletion of non-renewable natural assets must be compensated uh, by an increase in renewable natural capital, renewable natural assets. And that might sound a slightly arcane academic concept, but of course it has radical implications. Imagine if we had set aside the economic rents from depleting North Sea oil and gas and used it as a sovereign fund to enhance uh, Britain's natural renewable capital. That would be a set of resources and funding on a completely a uh, new scale, something that most environmentalists have probably never even dreamt about. So if we really are serious about natural capital and we're really serious about renewable natural capital and within that category those assets which are at risk of falling below the thresholds, then the revenues from the funding from the depletion of, of our non-natural uh, uh, natural capital and non-renewable, sorry, natural capital, uh, those are the revenues which are the money, the pot from which we could pay for the restoration which is clearly uh, very much needed. So if you think about funding more generally, there's the pot of money that comes from depleting non-renewable natural assets, but there are two others too. And uh, these are uh, of considerable importance uh, to all the kinds of renewable natural asset. The first of these is funding which we can call compensation. We know going forward that there's going to be more damage to our natural environment. You can't build 300,000 houses a year and not do damage. You can't do HS2 without doing damage. You can't build new runways without doing damage. And whether we like it or not, those things are going to happen and there will be, therefore, that damage. But the compensation principle says that if these projects are worthwhile doing, if it's worth doing this kind of damage, then in consequence, there should be a compensation elsewhere for that damage. And that compensation principle applied to the kinds of infrastructure and housing development we're about to see would provide substantive revenues. We can't do like for like. There are no exactly identical uh, and renewable natural capital assets, but we can use the money to do uh, uh, those things which have the best bucks in natural capital terms out of those compensation payments. Of course, in many cases, the gains couldn't uh, outweigh the losses, these developments shouldn't take place, but where they should, that compensation money should flow. 
And then the second area, which will be particularly interesting for those who focus on plants and plant sciences, is green taxes. It's a general principle that polluters should pay. There may be exceptions, but the idea that if you apply pesticides, herbicides, nitrates to the land, that you should have to pay for the damage you cause is something which any manufacturing or chemical com company would understand, but somehow we seem to think that it doesn't apply to farmers. Well, it should, and it ought to, and it would make a great deal of difference to our national well-being and to our sustainable economic growth if those polluters did pay. Now, if they do, the question is, what happens to the revenue? And I would argue that that revenue, plus the compensation payments, plus the money from depleting the non-renewable natural assets should all together provide the basis for a very substantial restoration fund, not holding the line, stopping people encroaching on the green belt, preserving a bit of nature here and there, but rather a large-scale, landscape-based, ecosystem-based, habitat system-based restoration of our natural capital across the economy. And when we apply this to plants and plant science, it's pretty obvious the implications are quite radical. Obviously, the starting point is the science. We need to identify those assets at risk, uh, those, where those thresholds are, and how they apply to the different units, species, habitats, ecosystems, and so on. We then need to identify what the safe limits are and what the targets are for addressing those uh, assets at risk and we need to apply compensation principles where there's any damage particularly to those assets but to natural capital generally. And you can imagine what herbicides, pesticides and nitrates taxes would do and those would provide the substantive restoration fund which would help our plant base as well as the rest of our ecosystems. So natural capital is a core concept it should be at the heart of thinking about plants, plant science and plant restoration. It brings the science into the core and it links that to the economics to enable us to have sustainable economic growth. Thank you very much.